Hello, Happy Valley. Today's video is all about the artist Leonardo da Vinci. Now, you could probably name a few of his famous paintings, such as The Last Supper or The Mona Lisa, but there's so much more to the man than just his artworks. He contributed to so many fields, and they are still valid today, such as the medical field, the military field, and he's even been thought of as being able to see into the future because some of his ideas and inventions were created long before the technology existed. Without further ado, let's learn about the true Renaissance man, Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci, the Renaissance man. Now you may be familiar with the Ninja Turtles. Maybe you know those four masters already. Um, these masters are developed from the Renaissance. So you have Raphael, Donatello, Michelangelo, and of course, Leonardo da Vinci. And the, the Ninja Turtles were created from these art masters. From my understanding, Master Splinter, when he was creating the Ninja Turtles, um, saw an art history book and decided to name the turtles after the Renaissance masters. Let's just talk about Leonardo himself. He is the true Renaissance man, a genius ahead of his time born in 1452, died in 1519. Now, Leonardo was born in Vinci, Italy, and that's where he gets Leonardo da Vinci of Vinci. Uh, he was an illegitimate son to a peasant woman and a successful notary. Now, because his mother and his father were not married, he became a illegitimate child. Uh, and because of that illegitimacy, he was unable to um, read any texts that were of Greek or Roman writing. So he was only able to learn basic reading, writing, and arithmetic skills from his father, from his grandfather. Uh, he was not allowed to get an, an education. Um, and so he really was a self-taught man. And I find a connection with myself and Leonardo da Vinci. I'm not a self-taught person, but he was always about learning, always about observing, always about building a better education. And that's what I'm about too. I am a lifelong learner. I love learning new things. Um, I'm not a master of anything. I'm more of a, a what is the term, jack of all trades. Okay, master of none. Um, I really love to, to learn a lot of things. And that's what I have that similarity with Leonardo. Of course, he was more of a, of a master than I'll ever be. But, um, you know, we have that similarity. So he grew up on a farm in Vinci. And it wasn't a very uh, established city at all. It was more of a, a rural farm town area. Uh, so he grew up in nature. And he learned a lot about the world through observation. Uh, he was a curious person and uh, very observant. He constantly tried to explain what he saw, find the science within, uh, find the reasoning within what he saw and, and develop an idea from that. So a very, very keen sense of observation. Now, he had really good skills, uh, artistic skills, and this was noted from his, his father, from his grandfather. So at the age of 12, he moved, or his father moved him to uh, Florence, Italy. Actually, his father and his, I guess, stepmother, uh, they moved to Florence, and so he followed behind. Uh, and Florence was a, a happening place. It was a major hub, a city hub in Italy. Um, you know, this is where things were going. There was trade going on, business going on, um, you know, this is a time of change, Renaissance meaning the rebirth, and this is where it was all happening. So at the age of 14 years old, he starts an apprenticeship with Verocio, uh, a very famous Italian sculptor and painter. And, you know, he learned a lot from, the, from this master, but actually it's said that he had higher skills than, than his his actual um, teacher, his actual master. Um, but what he, he learned, you know, his studies of nature and, and he tried to make things look more realistic. And during the Renaissance, we had this desire to create uh, natural looking things that make things look as realistic as possible. 
Now that comes from the Greek and Roman era where we really focused on defining beauty, making things look as realistic as possible, and then that got lost during the Middle Ages. Everything just completely, I don't know what happened, but they just lost it. Maybe the, the bubonic plague had a role in this. Um, I'm not really positive as to what happened, but just things, everything lost. All the ideas from the ancient eras were lost. And so at the Renaissance, we have this desire to relearn these skills, to redevelop these things. Uh, and, and that's what happens here. So he's trying to make things look as realistic as possible. And if you look at these angel wings, this is this is Leonardo da Vinci. So the painting itself belongs to Verocio. And when you were a master painter, you had so many people apprenticing underneath you, studying underneath you that would work on a painting at the same time. So the wings of this painting down here in the bottom left-hand corner, those were developed um, by Leonardo da Vinci. And he studied birds. He also he studied all kinds of animals. And he has so many... Uh, drawings and sketches working from from these studies so when I say Leonardo da Vinci was a true Renaissance man a, a Renaissance person a Renaissance man is somebody that has many talents many areas of knowledge and this is what I meant with when I have um, this connection with Leonardo. I see myself as a apprentice of a, of a Renaissance man. I, I see myself as a Renaissance woman, uh, somebody who loves to learn different areas. I'm always trying to learn things. And so um, what I have listed on the screen here, these are just some areas in which Leonardo was interested in, science, math, Mathematics. Uh, he was an engineer. He invented things. He was all about anatomy. Uh, again, he was a painter, a sculptor, an architect. And when you were an artist, especially during the Renaissance, you didn't just focus in one area. Yes, you were better at certain things than other things. Uh, you know, Leonardo was a much better painter than he was a sculptor or an architect, but that doesn't mean that he didn't blur those lines. He was also into botany, which is working with plants. Uh, he enjoyed music. He enjoyed writing. He even developed ideas or invented ideas for aerodynamics uh, and, and, of course, philosophy. Now, I'm sure you've maybe seen this. Well, not Homer here, uh, but the Vitruvian Man. And so this were, was a drawing, and this drawing that you've probably seen before, these are all based off of Leonardo. Leonardo drew these images. So... Of course, you probably can't do this today, but back during the Renaissance, you could purchase a cadaver or a deceased person's body. Uh, and you could, you know, and, that, and that's what he did. And he actually would dissect it, pull it apart, and, and create these drawings. He had an interest for understanding anatomy. And the drawings that we use in anatomy today, all, most of them, not all of them, but most of them generated from Leonardo da Vinci. And he would pull these muscles and pieces apart and study them uh, thoroughly over and over and over again. And he created a lot of these, these drawings. Again, he was a inventor. And this is why a lot of people say that he was from the future. He was able to develop things or, or had ideas for things um, long before the technology existed. Uh, he created, you know, a water lift, uh, so like a, an elevator um, based on hydraulics. Uh, he had the, the sketches of a crossbow, and that's what you see kind of in the middle there. Um, a catapult, see in the top right-hand corner. Um even uh, all kinds of landing gear for for aerodynamics for working with uh, you know with planes long before the thought of flight ever existed he had this desire to fly and that's why he studied birds a lot studied birds and their wings the birds the way they fly uh, he was able to see these these scientific advancements in, in machinery and in, in inventions long before the technology existed. He was, in effect, a very creative genius. Again, here are some more of his artworks, or not artworks, but his sketches of ideas. So the one on the top left-hand side, I believe that is a machine gun. 
And then, of course, you have a flying machine. Um, and, of course, you have a study of, of birds in flight, wings. And he had this, again, this desire. Uh, I think the one on the right-hand side is called an aerial screw, which would be like a helicopter. So he drew these structures over and over and over again, developing his own um, mechanisms and flying machines. Now he was hired by a, a king, the king of Milan. Milan is northern part of Italy, uh, to develop a lot of um, war machines. And, and so this is one of his inventions, the, the armored car, um, or basically the tank. Of course, it was designed with, with um, inside people would um, crank it like a bike pedal. Uh, and the wheels would turn. Not very effective. You know, it would have been great on flat ground, paved ground, but they didn't have that kind of thing during the Renaissance. Um, you know, we also have pictures of uh, cannons, of um, crossbows, of even, you know, again, just all these grand ideas um, developed. Now, Leonardo wrote in code. Uh, he wrote backwards. He was he was left-handed, which hey, I have that in common with him as well. Uh, but he wrote backwards, and people thought, oh, he has issues with writing. No, 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 no. He's a very genius person. He had tons of notebooks, tons of studies, and so he didn't want anybody to get his ideas. So he was able to write backwards, and we call this mirror writing. Uh, it was a code so that people. If, if they did get in, in touch with his his um, notebooks, um, they would have a difficult time reading or interpreting what he was saying. So this painting, I'm sure you've seen this before, The Last Supper. This was painted by Leonardo da Vinci, and it was done in Milan uh, at a, a church um, at the time. And... Uh, this was an experiment. So at the time during the Renaissance, there was a lot of new things happening. And one of those was the idea of creating different types of paint. So at the time, one of the most common ways of painting was to paint into, into wet plaster. Uh, and you would paint you know, pigments into that wet plaster. And once it dried, it became a solid form. But other things were happening like egg tempera. So that's mixing pigments with the egg yolk to create uh, a paint. Um, and then even up in the northern Renaissance, so up in the northern part of Europe, there was oil paints that were being invented. Of course, during this time, Leonardo lived uh, in Italy, so he's part of the Italian Renaissance. And they hadn't had access to these ideas, to these developments or um, innovations. Uh, so... Leonardo experimented with himself, uh, with his own artworks and with his own paints. And so for this one, he tried dry plaster and he mixed it with egg tempera and oils himself. Not oil paint, but oils. So again, I wish he wouldn't have done that with this painting, but uh, it started to deteriorate, flake apart, and even by the 16th century. Now, it's not just because of the experimenting with paint, um, but there's other issues that happen to it. First of all, the location. Um, it gets very, very cold. Milan is very close to the Swiss Alps, and so it gets very cold, very hot. This place was not air conditioned. Uh, they didn't have that type of thing. So we have this um, heat, cold, heat, cold happening, which is not going to help the paint at all. Uh, other things have happened to this poor little painting, like um, originally where he painted it, it was a dining hall. And on the opposite side of the dining hall was the kitchen. Well, they didn't have a doorway that went in between the two places, so the cooks would have to come from the opposite side to walk into the dining hall. Well, somebody had this grand idea to cut a hole into it to make a door. And so if you look right underneath Jesus on this painting or on this picture, you can see a little bit of a square. That's where they cut the door. Um, during the invasion of Napoleon, this was used as a prison. So we had and also horse stables. So we, you know, this was exposed to so many things. And then even during World War II, we had the bombing of the church 
uh, which completely destroyed the rooftop and left this painting exposed to the elements for quite some time. So it's it's been through quite a lot. And it's been restored so much that I would say only, you know, 25%, maybe even less, is actually from Leonardo's hand himself. The majority of it has been painted over by art historians and, and um, what's the word I'm trying to think of? Preserved preservers. So here is a much better picture and less grainy of that. So of course you can see down there at the bottom the door of course has been sealed again um, because it's no longer a functioning kitchen, functioning dining hall. Well, one of these, this is a one point perspective drawing. So let me first point that out. And another idea that um, Leonardo had was the idea of working in threes. Okay, this was a, a new formula that he introduced, and it's actually something that we still use today. Uh, the, the idea of grouping things in threes, um, which is called triangularity, is a much more uh, appealing thing to look at. Everything's done in a in a triadic formula. Okay. And here's some pictures of the devastation during World War II. You can tell, you know, or the painting is kind of right in this area. They did try to cover it up with scaffolding, uh, but of course the entire roof was was caved in uh, due to bombing. And the Last Supper uh, has been parodied several times. I just have a few to share with you. So let's get to one of the most famous paintings by Leonardo, the Mona Lisa. This painting has caused so much stir. It is one of the most infamous paintings uh, known in today's world, um, and it has so much that it has contributed to to the world of art um, and to the to really to the world. So during the Renaissance or, or pre-Renaissance, let me should say. Only the elite, the most rich, could have their portraits painted. It was a very expensive proposition. Um, but what we see during the Renaissance is a shift. We see that, you know, um, we see this growing class, the, the middle class is now growing, and they were able to um, purchase, um, you know, having their portraits created, um, being able to sit for you know, a long period of time. And so this actually is a painting of a, um, a merchant's wife. Now, Leonardo changed the way portraits were painted. Uh, he changed the formula in which portraits were painted. Um, you know, so this painting, again, like I said, has many innovations. Um, but what the most, I think the most important is, is that he changed this formula. If you look at the one on the left, this was what paintings, what portraits would have looked like during the Renaissance. And then you have Leonardo's, much, much different. Um, you know, generally paint paintings were of the chest up. So if you look on the left-hand side, chest up. She's also in a profile, so we're seeing the side of her face. Um, it's very static. It's a very stiff pose, very formal pose. Look at the amount of adornments on her. Um, look at her, her jewelry, her headpieces, her um, veil, if you must, in the back of her head. Okay. Look at the way the skin is being painted. All right, Very almost white. Uh, she looks like she's on the edge of the deathbed. Um, her skin is just very pale. But this was the way paintings were, were generated. And Leonardo change that entire thing. He turns the head towards us. He positions the shoulders at a three-quarter turn towards us again, and he's including the hands. So this is a half-length portrait, where before it was just at the chest up. 
She's in a much more natural pose. She's not adorned with jewelry. Uh, you know, she she doesn't have all these other accessories on her. She is a, you know, which one of these women would you want to have a conversation with? The one on the left or the one on the right? She was she was more inviting. Also, when you look at the backgrounds, on the left-hand side, a very crisp, detailed background. And what we have with the Leonardo is the sfumato. Okay? And a sfumato is a smoky background, a haziness uh, to the background. We have very soft outlines, very subdued colors, more natural-looking uh, skin. Now, there are theories around this painting. There's so much controversial um, conspiracies and things about this painting. And one of those theories is that this painting has so many layers underneath it, so many different versions underneath it. And it has been x-rayed several times and it's been, um, you know, under the, the, the watchful eye. And um, it is suggested that this painting has a lot of facial features similar to Leonardo's face. Um, so possibly maybe he he painted his self as a as a female. There's this is a, a again a theory. Um, you know he he recorded so much in his notebooks um, and he recorded every time that he had a model. But with Mona Lisa's model sitting, there's nothing to be found. So again, there's all these speculations um, that that Leonardo, um, you know, posed for this or has part of this was his own face. So the word Mona Lisa translates to my lady Lisa. And there's so much, uh, again, like I said, controversial things or conspiracies about this painting. And so this page is all about that. Uh, you know, Napoleon, it was said that Napoleon was obsessed with the Mona Lisa. And in fact, when he was um, invading, um, he had the painting hung over wherever he was staying over his bed and he confessed his undying love to Mona Lisa. Um, you know, very sick, wicked little man. Uh, where are her eyebrows? She has no eyebrows. Okay. Just as today where we draw on, you know, a lot of women draw on these angry bird eyebrows or these very boxy eyebrows. Um, during this time, it was very fashionable. It was a high fashion to shave off your eyebrows. Um, she, you know, if you look right above her head, and you see this little line right here. People think that that was... Um, her, her hairline but actually and it was very popular to shave your hairline back it was um, again another fashionable thing to um, to have no eyebrows and also have a huge forehead uh, but this little thing right here it's always been been suggested that that was her hairline but in, in fact it's a veil it's a very thin veil so you can kind of see it right there. There's the veil, uh, but you can kind of see bits and pieces of it in these little areas right here. Very thin, um, thin, thin, thin veil. Okay, much different than this chunky veil that you see on the woman on the left-hand side. So it's been said that Mona Lisa has broken so many hearts. And this is just a painting. Uh, there's, there's stories of men... Um, confessing their undying love for the Mona Lisa. Um, there's even, men, you know, men have committed suicide. There was a story of a man, um, I don't know what year, but he jumped off of the Louvre, which is where she's located. The Louvre is in Paris. It's a museum. Um, there's a story that a man uh, confessed his undying love to Mona Lisa and, and committed suicide by jumping off of the Louvre. Uh, she has, or I don't know if she still does, but she had her own mailbox at the Louvre and would receive so much fan mail. And I know that this is so bizarre to understand because this, we're talking about a painting here. And that's really what adds to the mystery of this painting is how does this painting have such a hold over people? She has been attacked. Um, at one point, somebody threw acid on her. She has been stolen. 
And then there's always the, is she smiling? Is she not? Is she looking at me? Um, all kinds of things like that. Now, in 1911, she was stolen, okay? And news headlines went around the world, which kind of accelerated her fame. Uh, you know, people started talking about the Mona Lisa, and this is really kind of what has accelerated her fame, uh, is that she was stolen. And the way that this happened is uh, the gentleman that stole the painting wore, you know, went to the Louvre. Of course, they didn't have video cameras at the time. Uh, and he wore a smock, which is like a big apron, um, which is what a lot of the curators, the art curators, would have worn during that time. And he simply walked by the Mona Lisa, picked up the painting, stuck it underneath his smock, and walked out. Nobody really noticed. Um, and here is an image of where the painting was sitting in between these two pieces. It wasn't until a few hours later that a curator walked by and actually realized that the painting was, was missing. And there are stories that Pablo Picasso had something to do with this. Of course, he did not. Uh, the painting was, was discovered, you know, I think, don't quote me, I think five or six years after it had been stolen. Uh, the gentleman that stole it tried to sell it. Of course, that must have been impossible because it was so famous due to those headlines being uh, published around the world. And so, of course, he was turned in. I believe it was in Italy that it was found. So the Mona Lisa had to make her way back to Paris where, where she was um, residing in the Louvre. And so she went on a little tour. Um, it wasn't just a direct um, from where she was found in Italy to, to the Louvre in Paris. Uh, she went on a nice little tour, stopping in towns. People would have their, their picture made with the Mona Lisa. Again, this accelerated her fame. Now she is housed in a bulletproof, uh, climate-controlled room in the Louvre. Uh, this picture is from a long, long time ago. She used to be exposed out in the halls and there was paintings all around her. Now she has her own room because of so many people coming to, to see the painting. And it's kind of, um, you know, upsetting that you look at this and you see, wow, it's super small. Um, I always, you know, imagined it as being such a, a large, grand painting. I saw it for the first time when I was about 13 years old. And there was a crowd, just like this picture has, just around it. And it's like that today. I pushed my way through because I'm 13 years old and I didn't care about anybody else but myself at the time. Pushed my way through, made it through the crowds, um, got a glimpse or a look at her and I thought, that's it. But now as an art teacher, as somebody who has studied the, the Renaissance, studied Leonardo himself, I really see a lot of um, what this painting has done for the art world, okay? What, what he was able to contribute to the art world that still exists today. His ideas, his thoughts that still impact today. Like all paintings, I love to show you guys a lot of um, parodies of these paintings. And of course, this one has been parodied time and time again. So you can see the veil on Miss Piggy. The gentleman on the right hand side, that is Salvador Dali. He is my absolute favorite artist. He was a surrealist, um, a very quirky, crazy little guy. Uh, he's somebody that we will learn about here in the next notebook assignment and be assignment. Um, you know, very weirdo. Uh, long before Photoshop, he created this picture. And of course, this one today. All right, so that is Leonardo da Vinci.